I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 is our text today. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1127 and you will find our text for the day. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these with you. It it is our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God because we know if you read the Word of God, God will change your life. Hey, we're, uh, we're skipping ahead to Romans 13 because uh, a lot of you are like going, hey, weren't we in Romans 8 last week? And what happened to all the ones in between? We're going to get there. But we, uh, we kind of adjusted the schedule because of the holiday that's coming up. Uh, you guys know that the 4th of July this year is on the 4th. And uh, it's Wednesday, 9 o'clock. We're going to have a great celebration in here. Hope you can come and, and be a part of that. Come pack in and, and celebrate. But, uh, but this text deals with... Uh, Uh, how we relate to government, how we relate to our nations. And I thought it was appropriate to kind of jump ahead and look at Romans 13. And uh, because we're we're celebrating our freedom, we're celebrating our faith. And I just want you to know, I praise God for the United States of America. It, it, uh, yeah, you guys can clap if you want to, if you're excited too. See, I believe uh, personally that the U.S. is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. It's because of the genius of our founding fathers, the freedom that we enjoy, the prosperity that we live in, the beauty of our nation. Uh, but I also believe that not just because I'm a, uh, you know, a patriot and a loyalist, but uh, because I've traveled extensively. I've been in you know, 32 countries, five different continents, and I've got something to compare it with. I mean, you don't really know that you know, there's better hamburgers than McDonald's unless you eat someplace else. And I've eaten some other places, and so I'm just telling you, based on on my experience, my travels, I'm a huge fan of the U.S. of A. And and I think that America is the greatest nation for reasons that you may not expect. Uh, For instance, I believe that America is the best because of public restrooms. (laughs) We have them, they're free, and usually they're somewhat private. Uh, And most of them even have toilet paper in them. I'm just telling you, that's that's a huge bonus. I, I, and I'm just being serious. If you've traveled like I have, you praise God for the skankiest, dirtiest, nastiest, you know, truck stop restroom you've ever encountered because it's there. See, I've, I've been in, uh, in Thailand where the, the, you know, the urinals for the men were on the outside back of the building. That's awkward. Can I just tell you that? Uh, I've been in what's now Russia where uh, I said I need a, a restroom and the guy goes, no, you don't. I go, yeah, I, I do. And so they pointed me in this room. I went into this like room and it was like the, you know, this closet sized place with one dim light bulb hanging there. There were like five holes in the ground, no dividers, no curtains, nothing, just five holes in the ground and about 20 guys in there. And I was like, you're right. I don't need it that bad. <laughs> been in Africa. There are no public restrooms, or public restrooms are everywhere. You know, the bush over here, the grass over here, the roadside over here. So uh, I, I praise God for America because of public restrooms. I also uh, believe America is the greatest nation because of traffic. Some of you are like, are you serious? Traffic? Yeah, have you guys ever driven in, you know, Southern California or, you know, Phoenix traffic, anything like that? Any, have you guys ever driven there? Because cars, they, they move together in roads. The, the, so here's the, you guys are going, no, I hate that traffic. It's terrible. It's horrible. Listen, most people in America follow the rules of the road. You know, at least the ones that really matter. You know, the ones that like stop signs, really important. Stop lights, really important. Driving on the correct side of the road, really important. And I've been places where all of those were optional. And if traffic slowed down, people just drove into the wrong lane of traffic. They didn't care. They just I've got to get there. And so every man for himself. You know the phrase, if you don't like the way I drive, stay off the sidewalk? That's reality in some countries. Okay? That's just how they drive. And, and the, the pedestrian does not have the right of way. Uh, and, and, and so I praise God for American traffic. The order with which we, you know, get from point A to point B. And then the last reason I believe America is the greatest nation is kind of personal. It's two words. Free refills. (laughs) See, I have a Diet Pepsi problem, and uh, uh, and it it kills me when I go into a restaurant and sit down, I order a drink, and, and, you know, it's $3 for the drink, but you know what? They'll fill it up again and again, two, three, eight times, whatever I'm going to drink, depending on how long we're there. But in other countries, they just stare at you like, nope, we don't have those here. 
You got to pop down another $3 or $4 for another drink. Uh, and, and it's just so annoying. And so every time I come back to the States, I'm like, thank you, God, for free refills. No, seriously, uh, America is the, the best country in the world because of our freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, the entire freedoms guaranteed in the Bill of Rights are amazing. Uh, we're the best because of opportunity. We've got economic opportunity, we've got educational opportunity, we've got uh, career opportunities. I mean, hey, you can pursue your dreams here. You can fail and you can start all over and still pursue your dreams. It's amazing. By the way, that is really, really rare in this world that we live in. And, and it's one of the reasons why so many people in the world want to be here. Because if you live there, you would want to be here as well. Uh, and then there's prosperity. Our system, our culture of free enterprise and personal responsibility has resulted in tremendous wealth for our nation. And, and I don't care who you are, if you're an adult in this room, you are one of the you know, wealthiest people in this world. You're in the top 10% wealthiest people in the United States of America, or in the entire world, even if you're living at the poverty level. Understand, that's how much wealth we have, that the poor people in America are richer than 90% of the world. And most of us in this room, honestly, are in the top 5% wealthiest people in the world. That, and so you got to praise God, I, at least I have to praise God for the United States of America because God is responsible for establishing nations. God is responsible for establishing nations. Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul, who is a Roman citizen, is writing to the church in Rome, and he says this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed is owed. Uh, God's responsible for establishing nations. Really, if you boil it back down, God is responsible. He's responsible for creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so all authority flows from God. He is the ultimate authority. If there is a position of authority, then God established it. So think about it. Parents, you're the authority in your household. God has placed you in authority over your children to raise them, to protect them, to nurture them, uh, to teach them. It's your responsibility to teach them, to educate them, and to lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And God makes it really clear the parental responsibility, the parental authority in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where he says, hey, you've got to be the one who teaches your kids these things. You're the one who's responsible for that. So God gave you that authority as parents. That means you ought to be running the household, not the two-year-old. And then pastors and spiritual leaders have been given authority by God in churches to lead people and to teach people and to shepherd people. And that authority has been given by God. And governments have been given authority for their citizens. Now, God establishes governments to bless the people. Did, did you catch what Paul was saying there? He said, hey, they're the ones who are promoting justice. They're the ones who are defending the innocent. They're the ones who are supposed to be doing this. God establishes governments to bless their people. So do governments always bless their people? <laughs> like three people up here got the answer. Do governments always bless their people? No. no. I mean, if you study history, you read the, the news, you know that governments don't always bless their people. And, and we're like, well, then why would God allow governments to do that? Um, do pastors always bless their churches? No. No. Do parents always bless their children? No. 
You see, the authority that God gives, he also holds us accountable to it. But here's the reality. God gives that authority, and we abuse that authority because we're sinners. Because of sin in this world, we act in destructive ways, and, and we don't always honor God's plan or God's intention. So even though we want to bless our kids, we don't always bless our kids. And even though uh, pastors don't uh, want to bless their churches, they don't always do that. And governments don't always bless their people. But God has given them that responsibility for justice and order and protection. And we know that governments often fail to do what God has entrusted them with. And a lot of times they curse their people instead of blessing their people. And know this, they have to answer to God for that. Matthew 25, there are three parables of judgment that, that Jesus shares. And the last one is the judgment of the nations, literally the ethnic groups. The, the tribes will be brought before God and have to answer. And the people who are in authority are going to have to give an account for the abuse of power that they exercise. That's reality. So governments are, are judged by God. And sometimes we see that judgment in real time. And sometimes we see it in history because kingdoms rise and fall. Hitler's Third Reich lasted 15 years. Soviet communism lasted 70 years. Uh, the American Republic, we have been in existence, if we make it to Wednesday, 242 years and counting. That's good, but the Rome Republican Empire lasted 700 years. You see, nations that promote injustice and abuse their citizens will not last. So God is responsible for establishing nations. What does it have to do with us? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then understand that God expects you to be an amazing citizen of whatever nation you find yourself in. So uh, let's talk for a little bit about Christian citizenship. What are some expectations that God has for those of us who are his children? If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, listen in, because I'm going to explain the, what I think God expects of us as his followers. You may want to kind of uh, take a glimpse at what we believe and about how that's exercised, at least here at Calvary. So as followers of Christ, citizenship is a responsibility. And, and we ought to be citizens to the glory of God. In other words, how we operate as citizens ought to bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ. So uh, let me just share some things that that means. If we're going to be good Christian citizens, then we need to participate. We need to participate. We live in a democratic system that allows us to have a voice and a vote. Okay, a voice and a vote. So uh, we ought to participate because we have that privilege to do that. I hope you realize that the majority of your brothers and sisters around the world do not have that privilege. There are many places where people don't have a voice or a vote in their government system. And so God has placed us in a, in a nation where we have a voice and a vote. Um, and by the way, God gave you that. That's not something you asked for. Because none of us asked God to let us be born in America. Anybody make that choice about where you were born? No, you didn't. See, this is grace. God has allowed you to be born into this amazing country uh, or, or live. And by the way, if you chose to be a citizen, if you're naturalized, <laughs> kudos to you because you made a great choice. But, but here's the thing. We, we have a responsibility to influence through the process. So we ought to vote our convictions. I, I think you ought to be registered to vote. If you're eligible, you ought to be registered to vote. And you ought to vote your convictions. And I hope and pray that your convictions are built upon God's word reason that we ask you to read this, because we know it'll change your life, it'll teach you how to think. Here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inspired and errant Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And, and so we will never tell you who to vote for, but we will encourage you to vote, and we'll encourage you to vote based on the wisdom of God's Word. Participate. So that means voting. That means getting active and things. Uh, you may not know this, but we have a number of people from our congregation that are running for office, some locally, some nationally. Uh, we've got people who are running for city council, people who are running for constable, uh, and we have one who's running for U.S. senator. In fact, she happens to be with us this service today. Kelly Ward is here, and uh, Dr. Kelly Ward's over there, so I'm going to say hi to Kelly. Uh, and uh, 
And I just think that's cool because that's, that's one way that people are getting involved and in saying, hey, we want to change our process, our, our system, our community. We want to make a difference by being involved in that. So we want to participate by being involved. We want to vote. But we must represent Christ in our involvement in the public square. We must represent Jesus in our involvement in the public square. So that means a couple of things. First of all, as Christians, we do not need to hide, abstain, or separate. A separation of church and state does not mean that if you're a person of faith that you need to disappear and shut up. We have a vote and we have a voice. Now, I share that with you. And at the same time, you need to understand that if you participate in the public square, there's a lot of the convictions that you may have that people may find unpleasant, distasteful, or disagree with. And, uh, and they may express their feelings about your convictions and about you personally uh, because they may not like it. And one of the things that I've noticed, especially about my generation and older, is um, we want to express our convictions and we want those to be received well. I mean, most of us really don't want to be seen as a jerk, right? But if you express your biblical-based convictions, um, there's a lot of people who are not going to like you. There's a lot of people who are going to say things about you. And, and by the way, that shouldn't really surprise us because that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, uh, if people hate you, don't be surprised they hated me first. If people persecute you, don't be surprised they persecuted me first. And, and then in Matthew 5.11, which is part of the Beatitudes, he says this, blessed are you when people revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, for in the same way they treated the prophets who were before you, and great is your reward in heaven. Now, those are the words of Jesus, but can I just tell you that when people are reviling you and saying all manner of evil against you falsely, it does not feel like a blessing. It just really doesn't. But if we're going to participate in the public square and we're going to voice biblical convictions, then that's part of the package. And we need to understand that. We need to be aware of that. Now, along with that, this is really important. While we don't need to hide, abstain, or separate, Christians need to reflect the character of Christ in the public square at all times. Let me say that again. Christians need to reflect the character of Christ in the public square at all times times. Here at Calvary, uh, one of our core values is character. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And one of the big commands that Jesus gave is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So that means that as we're in the public square, we need to use our words to bless. We need to use our words to build up. We need to use our words to teach truth, not to denigrate, to curse, or to attack those who differ in their opinions from us, even if they're attacking us. And that means that we don't need to do it verbally. We don't need to do it personally. We don't need to do it on social media. And I know how it plays out. You're reading the news. You're listening to people uh, state their opinions on Facebook or, you know, whatever format they choose, and it makes you angry. Anybody read the news and get angry? Sides me? Okay. That's why I ration how much news I take in, how much stuff I read, because I don't want to live life angry. And you read that, and you're just like going, I need to correct their thinking. <laughs> right? That's what you feel inside of you. I need to correct their thinking. I need to tell them where they're wrong. And when we want to do that, you want to use descriptive words. Right? You want to use words like moron, idiot, racist, homophobe, bigot, Nazi, snowflake. And maybe you've got some other words that you want to use. Here's the thing. You can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And you can't love your neighbor if you're calling him names. It just isn't going to happen. You can't love your neighbor and be angry at them at the same time. And so we want to be active in that public square, but we want to represent Jesus in all of our involvement. And it really helps to remember that God is not a Republican. And God is not a Democrat. And God is not a socialist, and he's not a libertarian, he's not a communist. 
God is King of kings and Lord of lords. And by the way, he doesn't need your vote. Just saying. In fact, you surrendered to him when you confessed Jesus as Lord. You, you said, you're, you're my king, you're my owner, you're the one that I'm going to serve. Your values are now my values. Your way of living life is now my way of living life. And, and I want to honor you in everything that I do. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we want to reflect Jesus' character in the public square. So are you? Are you participating? Are you using your voice and your vote to promote the will of God? Are you representing Jesus well in the public square? Because Jesus calls us to participate and Jesus calls us to abide by the law. As Christian citizens, we abide by the law. Uh, that means that we submit to the authority that God has placed over us. Uh, Paul was really clear about that. If you submit to the authority, you don't have to worry about the, the getting in trouble. You know, God's put them over you. He's established that authority. We're supposed to submit. And, and that means that we submit to the authorities that God has placed over us unless they ask us to do something that is unbiblical or immoral. There is a point where they may ask us to do something that uh, God has said don't do or prohibited us from doing, in which case we have to say no. But in all other cases, we're supposed to submit to the authority. And so that means, as Paul was really blunt, we pay our taxes. Did, did you notice that? I hate the fact that he was so clear. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed. Right. Right. You know what that means? That means that we have to pay our taxes and we have to be honest about that. We need to follow the rules. You want to do a quick uh, unpleasant integrity check? Look at your tax returns and evaluate your honesty. It means that we need to honor our law enforcement publicly and personally. Now, the public part is so easy, isn't it? You just like stuff on Facebook and share it and go, oh, yeah, I'm pro, you know, law enforcement. I'm pro first responders. I think they do a great job. You clap at ceremonies, and, and every now and then you say to somebody, hey, thanks for serving. That's the easy part. That's publicly. But personally, do you honor them when the lights are behind your car? <laughs> do you honor them when they pull you over? Or are you angry and rude and demanding and accusing in that moment? Or do you treat them with kindness and respect? Respect where respect is due. Because you're representing Jesus in that moment. You see, we obey the law. And, and some of you are going, you're telling us to obey the law, and yet you're a self-confessed speeder. Yes, I, I tend to drive over the posted speed limit, uh, but here's the thing, when I'm stopped, which is not all that infrequent, uh, uh, number one, I confess. I don't, you know, try to pretend, I, I, don't, I don't know why you stopped me. Do you know why I stopped you? Yeah, I'm just checking my speedometer to see if it matches what you've got. Uh, <laughs> no, I, look, I, I'm honest. I, I know I was driving too fast. Uh, was, I usually go, is there anything else I was doing wrong? Uh, but, uh, but I also accept the consequences. See, see, that's just it. I, I'm, I submit to the authority. I accept the consequences. I'm respectful in that moment. Uh, and, and so, uh, yes, we obey the law. As a church, we obey the law. Oftentimes, people go, oh, we don't have to follow that rule. We don't have to follow that law. And, and we're encouraged at times to do things outside legal bounds. But we refuse to do it. We don't make illegal photocopies. We don't use unlicensed music. We don't do unpermitted improvements. Even if we don't agree with the law, we still try to abide by the law. Now again, if the law contradicts with biblical convictions, live your biblical convictions and accept the consequences. Accept the consequences. Uh, so if it becomes illegal to preach the Bible, to preach the gospel, then I guess I'll preach it in prison. Because I'm not going to stop. And there are places in this world, countries in this world, where followers of Jesus Christ have to make that decision. Are we going to break the law and assemble? Are we going to make, break the law and preach? Are we going to make the, break the law and, and make disciples? And they do, and oftentimes there are consequences to that. By the way, this whole thing that Paul is, is sharing, he lived it. 
He submitted to the authorities that put him in prison. He submitted to the authorities that for about 200 years actively persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, killing people, imprisoning people, destroying families. And because the church responded with the character of Christ and because they responded in a way that said, we're going to submit to the authorities, but we're going to accept the consequences, you know what happened at about the 250-year mark after Paul wrote this? Christianity conquered the empire through the love of God and the power of, of the gospel. And it transformed an empire and it transformed history because the followers of Jesus Christ lived that out. So we want to be great citizens while we're here. But we as followers of Jesus need to remember our ultimate citizenship. Our ultimate citizenship. Uh, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, which was a very Roman uh, church, uh, said this, chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, Paul said that as a Roman citizen. In, in ancient Rome, you had Roman citizens, and then you had free people, and then you had slaves. And he was at the top of the heap, and he was writing to a church in, in Philippi that had a lot of Roman citizens in it. And he said, hey, even though we're Roman citizens, even though we got privileges, even though we have rights, even though we have all these, these extra things given to us, that's not our key focus. Our focus is on the fact that we belong to Jesus and our citizenship is in heaven. And we're waiting for Jesus to come back and to change this world that we live in. To redeem us from our sins and, and to give us those new bodies. We're going to live in that new nation where, where it's perfect. He says that's our hope and that's our allegiance. So I can proudly tell you that I love the United States of America. I am proud to be a citizen. But I'll also tell you without any hesitation that my first allegiance is to Jesus. You see, the United States is temporary. 242 years and counting, but it's not going to last forever. The kingdom of Jesus is forever. He is the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. I already told you that I believe the United States of America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but it is flawed. There are deep flaws in our country. We, that's why the news is so frustrating as people debate what should be done or what shouldn't be done. The kingdom of God is a perfect nation that is made up of flawed people that God will perfect. Isn't that cool? This perfect nation, the kingdom of God, is made up of those of us who are deeply flawed, but God fixes us, redeems us, makes us perfect. America is a nation that is great because it was founded on biblical principles. The genius of our founding fathers is still blessing us today. But if you're a follower of Jesus, then you're in the family of God and you're called to live out those biblical principles every single day in whatever nation God places you. That's why he was able to transform the, the Roman Empire from pagan antichrist to a Christian empire. Because people were living out those principles of God day in and day out. And the power of the church was not political or economic, but it was in their witness of how they lived their lives. So who has your heart? Who's your first allegiance to? I ask that question, and I hope that it, it's one that sticks with you throughout the week. Because this needs to be an honest conversation between you and God. Doesn't need to involve me, doesn't need to involve other people. This needs to be you and God getting real about your allegiance. Because we, a lot of times in our churches, we are very much God and country. God and country. And, and we don't really distinguish between the two. And a lot of times we act like they can be equals, and they can't. Can I just be honest? They can't. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You'll love the one, hate the other. You'll cling to one and despise the other. It can't be God and country as co-equals. There's got to be one that takes priority in your life. Honestly, which one is it? Because 
Jesus challenged us with the great commandment where he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It's the first and great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus wants all of you. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your mind. He wants all of your strength. He wants all of you. And here's the thing. If you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you know what happens? You become a better American citizen. You become a better person. You become a better spouse. You become a better parent. You become a better employee. You become a better uh, friend. In the totality, as you surrender to Jesus, he will elevate your personhood. And so he wants you to love him more than you love your nation so that you can love your nation more. So here's a couple of kind of test thoughts, if you will. If we violate our Christian character in order to express our patriotism or our politics, our allegiance might be upside down. If we get more upset or more passionate about politics and about being right than about our friends or family going to hell, then our allegiance is probably out of alignment. Now, let me get really blunt. If it bothers you more that your brother-in-law is a Democrat or your father-in-law voted for Trump than it does the reality that neither one of them confesses Jesus as Lord or ever sets foot in a church, then your priorities are out of whack. So who has your heart? Where is your allegiance? You see, I love my country. And I want all of us to be excellent citizens. But even more, I love Jesus. And I want all of us to, to know Jesus and to love Jesus and to follow Jesus and to be excellent servants of Jesus Christ, representing him to a world that is desperate to know him. Will you pray with me?